What was it like? How has it changed? These perennial questions are the basis for this series of programmes looking at how Britain's railways have changed over the years. In this, the second of five programmes, we'll compare how things have changed on the Southern Railway between then and now. We start on the Eastern Division in 1963, at one of the most important places on the system. After the completion of the Kent Coast electrification in 1961, Ashford Works, built in 1847 for the South Eastern Railway, remained an oasis of steam. Three of Harry Wainwright's C-class locomotives were employed there as work shunters. On the 17th of July in 1963, two of them are seen here at work. Number 31592 can be seen today on the Bluebell Railway. Number 31280 was not so lucky, being scrapped at Ashford in December 1963. Joining a train, we passed the works and hurried down the southeastern main line through Folkestone. Here, one of the Class E5000 electrics is seen near to the junction with the steeply graded 1 in 30 Folkestone Harbour branch. Our train is now passing along the famous stretch of line in Folkestone Warren. In steam days, there was a small Warren halt for visitors to the beaches here. The English Channel is glimpsed before we dive into the twin bores of Archcliffe Tunnel, which opened on the 7th of February, 1844. The train continues along the foot of the famous White Cliffs, which caused many problems with cliff falls. We enter the famous cross-channel port, where Dover Castle stands sentinel as Hawkesbury Street Junction is passed. This was the junction to Dover Marine Station, opened to the public in January 1919. Dover Marine joined the ranks of endangered species in the 1990s, but a preservation order was placed on it. It had become synonymous with the great continental boat trains, but the advent of the Channel Tunnel was to render it surplus to requirements, like the steam engines before it. Even their successors, the E5000 class electrics, had become redundant in the 1970s, but one, like Dover Marine Station, is preserved. Here we see it on a special train run to mark the closure of the station. Less than two years later, the only tracks at Dover Marine are on the bulldozers as the site is cleared ready for its next incarnation as a supermarket. Dover Marine's nemesis is seen next, as works along Folkestone Warren in connection with the Channel Tunnel are seen in the late 1980s. The internal railway system here was one of the largest seen in this country. Even the Class 33 diesel is a threatened species now. Today the Warren has been restored to tranquility, broken by the occasional steam hauled train, in this case the famous Orient Express, running as the Golden Arrow in 1995. This was the most famous of the continental boat trains, which at times ran from both Dover and Folkestone Harbour.
Folkestone Junction is the next place we return to as a standard Kent Coast electric train made of classes 4 SIG and 4 VEP emerges from Folkestone Tunnel and passes the carriage sidings which still remain. On this occasion, the latter contain a steam train, marking one of two events in the 1990s when steam returned to the harbour branch. The train left the sidings headed by a BR standard tank number 80080. The class was used throughout the southern in the last days of steam. The train is next seen leaving the harbour station headed by a Bullet Pacific number 34027 Tor Valley. This recalled the great days of the Golden Arrow for many people. The modern successor to the Golden Arrow is the Eurostar. Our final view of Kent Railways is where we started, Ashford, where a direct Paris to London Eurostar is seen departing from the International Station, opened in 1995. The town is once again an important place on the railway map. We move from the east of the southern to the west at Wadebridge. The Bodmin and Wadebridge Railway was one of the earliest component parts of the southern railway's constituent, the London and South Western Railway. Near the end of the line's existence on the 8th of September 1964, Standard Class 4 tank 80039 drifts through the station light engine. A branch line from Wadebridge to Wenford Bridge was worked for many years by three venerable BT well tanks, which had become very well known. Sadly, in 1962, they had been replaced by three Great Western engines, Collett's 1366 class pannier tanks, built in 1934. Only six were built, and one of these, 1368, is seen shunting at Wadebridge station. They were unusual in being the only Great Western pannier tanks with outside cylinders. They'd been used on the Weymouth Key Line for many years. 1368 was scrapped by Woodhams of Barry in March 1965. The Bodmin and Wadebridge Line remained physically separated from the rest of the London and South Western Railway system until the end of the 19th century, when the North Cornwall Railway reached Wadebridge. The line was then extended from Wadebridge to Padstow, opening on the 27th of March, 1899. It closed to passenger traffic on the 30th of January, 1967. Pleasure craft await weekend sailors on the nearby River Camel, as Mansell Mogul 31837 is turned on Wadebridge Shed's turntable. Number 31837 was one of Mansell's 80-strong N-class. She was built at Woolwich Arsenal in July 1924 as part of a government scheme to help unemployment after the First World War. A total of 82 were built there, with boilers from the North British Locomotive Company. The Southern bought 50 at a bargain price, hence their nickname Woolworths. Number 31837 met her end at Birds of Morriston, Swansea in November 1964. Richard Mansell, born in Dublin, was chief mechanical engineer of the South Eastern and Chatham Railway Company, then of the Southern Railway from 1913 to 1937. The mainstay of passenger train services in the last days of the North Cornwall Line were standard class 4 264 tanks. Number 80039 runs into Wadebridge to pick up a considerable number of passengers. 
We're now going to join 80039 as she hauls away for a trip over the North Cornwall line to Launceston. We pause at the second station out from Wade Bridge, Port Isaac Road, on the section opened on the 1st of June 1895. Its very name indicates how the late arrival of the line failed to increase development. countryside famous for the Arthurian legends is seen from the train and Delibold Quarry the only real industry in the area is glimpsed before arrival at Camelford station which opened on the 14th of August 1893 this was the last major railway built for any of the southern railways constituents and was too late to have very much of an impact on the social scene of this very desolate coastline the concrete station sign at Egluskerry announces the arrival of the train there. These signs were produced at the Southern's Concrete Works at Broad Clist in Devon. The section of line from Egluskerry to Launceston was opened on the 21st of July 1892. Number 80039 runs round its train at Oakhampton, passing Mickey Mouse Tank number 41206. Oakhampton Station on the northern slopes of Dartmoor was opened on the 3rd of October 1871 and was the main junction station for the Southern's lines to Plymouth and to Bude and Wadebridge. Collectively, these secondary lines were known as the Withered Arm, and it's doubtful whether some of these ever made any money at all. The thumb of the withered arm was Ilfracum Station, opened on the 20th of July 1884, and it's seen briefly. It was situated high above the town on the steeply graded line from Barnstable Junction. The line between the towns was closed completely on the 5th of October 1970. Our train is headed by a bullet Pacific as it climbs up to Morto at the summit of the line. The Southern crossed rather more than swords with its arch rival, the Great Western, at Exeter St. David's. The station was opened by the Bristol and Exeter Railway in 1844, and the first train was driven by Daniel Gooch, locomotive superintendent of the Great Western from 1837 to 1864. The two railways shared the lines through St. David's, which in effect formed a pivot for both systems in the West Country as southern and western trains for London departed in opposite directions. It's now the 8th of September 1964 and standard class 3 tank number 82040 is shunting a couple of Mansell moguls at the Great Western Shed. Call it pannier tanks 4694 and 4692 trundle through the station as number 82040 continues its shunting operations. The Class 3 tanks were designed for station pilot duties and local passenger work, primarily on the Western, although they were perhaps better known for their work on the Southern. Pannier tanks 4694 and 4692 attach themselves to the rear of a stone train, as another pannier 4666 couples onto the front of the train engine, standard Class 5, number 73030. All four engines blast away up the 1 in 37 bank to the Southern's own station at Exeter Central, exerting over 93,000 pounds of tractive effort. This severe climb marks the change from Western to Southern metals, this train conveying ballast stone from the Southern's great quarry at Meldon for use on all parts of the Southern system. Exeter West signal box seen to the right of the picture as the stone train disappears is now preserved at the Crew Heritage Centre. Back in the platforms, number 82040 brings withdrawn Mickey Mouse tank number 41323 out from storage. This was a sad time for steam lovers. 
Panier Tank 4694 runs through number one platform in order to assist the standard class three, as 41323 is taken away for scrapping at Cohen's of Modest and Swansea. Even when the load was one dead locomotive, assistance was still needed. The pannier tank was herself scrapped at wards of Britain Ferry in October 1965. Rebuilt bullied Battle of Britain Pacific 34052 Lord Dowding, running through light engine to take up its next duty, brings a genuine southern flavour to round off our views here. Retracing our footsteps today reveals a very different scene. The withered arm was amputated in 1966, although the China clay traffic on the Wenford Bridge branch meant that Wade Bridge kept its station for goods only for a while longer. Now, however, the local shed and goods yard have been taken over by housing, although the station building remains, dedicated to one of the great lovers of railways. The iron railings indicate this was once where the enthusiasts of the 60s stood, overlooking the yard the small Beatty and Pannier tanks once shunted. The former goods shed also survives, enjoying a new function. The pioneering Bodmin and Wadebridge railway that dated from the early 19th century is now a walker's trail. The current name derives from the River Camel, which it follows into Bodmin. On the North Cornwall line, Port Isaac Road is one of the few stations that still retains its railway look. It's easy to imagine the Cornish portion of the Atlantic Coast Express rattling in behind a Drummond T9. This is due to the enlightened attitude of the present owners, who are lovingly restoring it to its original condition. Wouldn't it be nice to see track between the platforms once again? The goods shed and its later additions still remain at Port Isaac Road. Moving on, we come to Delabole. The station still survives, but is rather isolated in a sea of new building work. Delabole Quarry, the largest in the world at one time, still produces the famous slates. But the line of the railway, which lasted barely two-thirds of a century, is difficult to see. Just around the corner from Delabole, the course of the line, another third of a century on since closure, is more easily tracked. The exposed nature of the area is ideal for the modern form of back-to-basics power. A different form of old-fashioned power, the push bike, is celebrated at the old Camelford station. The canopy remains, or rather the supports remain, inside the museum. The approach road on the western side of the line still has railway artefacts. Oakhampton is one of the enigmas of the withered arm. 
The station buildings, goods shed, and even the signal box and covered footbridge remain today, albeit in a very run-down condition. The station retained a truncated service from Exeter for some time after all the other lines in the area had closed, but it too eventually succumbed. A few summer weekend services have been provided at odd intervals and proposals are frequently put forward to reinstate the service, but to no avail. However, the line through the station survives to this day, serving the legendary Meldon Quarry. As a result of the Conservative government's privatisation of the railways, the line from the quarry to Crediton was sold outright to English China Clays in 1995. Regular ballast and stone trains still pass through Oakhampton. Exeter St David's remains the southwest's principal railway crossroads to this day. Both the western and southern continue to serve it throughout the British Railways era. Today it is served by more individual rail companies than ever before. However, even these scenes, apparently recent, are now history as the haulage of normal passenger trains by diesel locomotives ceased in 1994. This Class 50 diesel type now being extinct on British rail metals, as is British rail itself. Today, former Great Western mainline services from London Paddington are in the hands of a new Great Western company, Great Western Trains, which exclusively uses high-speed trains. Through trains from the north of England and Scotland are handled by cross-country trains use a combination of HSTs and locomotive halt stock. Mail and parcels and all general freight operations are now all in the hands of one company, English, Welsh and Scottish Railways, a consortium led by the American railroad Wisconsin Central. This took over four separate freight and mail businesses that had been established by the government in preparation for privatisation. So very many livery variations were to be seen on freight locomotives in the mid-1990s. Passenger services now covering all the western and southern lines, fully integrated, are dealt with by South Wales and West, which has a variety of self-contained sprinter units. These trains cover duties on the ex-southern lines to Barnstable, the sole survivor of the Withered Arm routes, and to Exmouth, as well as western services to Torbay and Cornwall. The final operator at Exeter is Southwest Trains, successor to the LSWR and Southern Railway on the Southern's West of England main line. All trains on this line are now provided by a variation of the Sprinter family, the Class 159 units. This one is leaving St David's and climbing up the gradient on its way to London via Yeovil. We're also going to Yeovil and back once again to the days of steam, as our next stop is Yeovil Junction, 123 miles from Waterloo on the Southern's main line to the West Country. It first saw traffic on the 19th of July, 1860, over a century before. On the 9th of September, 1964, a Collet pannier tank brought a two-car auto train in from Yeovil Town and departed into the setting sun under the magnificent Southern signal gantry. All Southern lines west of Salisbury had just fallen into the hands of the Western region and in these gloomy post peaching days, it was fully expected that the lines would be closed. A 
a grimy churchward designed small prairie number 4593 was shunting a parcels train in the extensive sidings. 4593 had a long life, being built at Swindon in 1927 and scrapped at Birds of Risker 38 years later. This class, built for branch line work in the West Country, numbered 175 examples. 14 of the class have been preserved. However, at this time they were extending their duties, as the Western lost no time in transferring its own locomotives to cover duties such as these on the lines it had just acquired. Standard Class 4 Mogul, number 76066, drifts through Yeovil Junction on another parcels train. This Doncaster-designed class was introduced in 1953 for freight and semi-fast passenger duties. 115 examples were built. 76066 was withdrawn from Salisbury Shed and scrapped at Cohen's of Morriston, Swansea in November 1967. College 6400 pannier tanks had replaced the London and South Western Railway's M7 tanks on the auto train service to Yeovil Town in 1963. The 6400s numbered 40 examples, although there were 25 in the 5400 series. A further 50 non-auto fitted engines were numbered in the 7400 series. The class was introduced in 1932 and all were built at Swindon. We've now joined the auto train headed by number 6430, now preserved on the Dart Valley, on a trip up the main line to Sherbourne, four and a half miles away. The driver checks his watch and walks to the driving coach. Luggage is loaded onto the auto train before it crosses over to the down line for the return trip to Yeovil. The main line of the London and South Western reached Sherbourne on the 7th of May, 1860. The large gong used for warning can be seen above the auto coach's window. This was operated by a foot pedal. The important market town of Sherborne was perhaps known to railway enthusiasts through its public school. Mansell's famous schools class number 30906 was named after it. Yeovil Junction is soon reached and the auto train returns to its regular run from Yeovil Junction to the town station. Of three stations at Yeovil, namely Junction, Town and Penn Mill, only Yeovil Town has been closed, along with the branch to it, on the 2nd of October 1966. Yeah. Templecombe was 11 miles up the line to Salisbury, and Bullet Pacific 34049 anti-aircraft command heads through with an express for Exeter. She's quickly followed by 34074, 46th Squadron, hauling a Mickey Mouse tank towards Salisbury. At Salisbury, the most important station on the West of England main line, Mansell S15, number 30844, backs into the bay platform to haul a stopping train westwards. One of Mansell's 50-strong U-class moguls, number 31613, then passes Salisbury C signal box. Today, the West of England main line is thriving once again, after the threats to its existence in the 1960s. The Western had been forced to retain it, even though they wanted to concentrate traffic on their own rival route. But in the 1970s and 80s, it had gradually returned to southern ownership. The true revival began in the 1980s, when Network South East was formed, and the various British rail sectors were encouraged to compete. NSE increased the public profile of the line, which included the running of steam specials from Salisbury to Yeovil Junction. The junction station is but a shadow of its former self, as the Western, prevented from closing the line, had reduced it to a single track, closing many of the intermediate stations. For a time, Yeovil Junction itself was threatened, passengers being expected to drive to Sherbourne to get on a train. Wiser councils prevailed, and Yeovil Junction remains today and is still a junction. 
In 1994, celebrations were held to mark 150 years of railways at Yeovil. A steam service was restored for the weekend between Yeovil Junction and Penn Mill using an LSWR Drummond M7 tank, the Southern's favoured power until the Western takeover. From here to Templecombe remains double track, the only such section in the 88 miles from Salisbury to Exeter. We move on to Sherbourne with a modern then scene, showing the class 50 days of the early 1990s. The real now seen at Sherbourne is illustrated by one of the ubiquitous Class 159 unit trains. The advent of these trains has seen a substantial increase in patronage, and the line now has a secure future. Templecombe station was actually closed by the Western Region, but a vociferous campaign was mounted to reopen it, and it opened in the 1980s. It marks the beginning of the double line stretch to Yeovil, although the line through the platform remains single track. The last days of the class 50s saw an amazing display of affection by enthusiasts. Salisbury's importance as the hub of the line was further strengthened when the maintenance facility for the fleet of Class 159 units was established here in 1993. This was to see the end of locomotive haulage on the line for passenger traffic, the line being the last main line in Great Britain to retain locomotives. However, Salisbury's strategic role as a crossroads between the West of England main line and the Portsmouth and Southampton to Bristol and Cardiff route has meant that it still sees a considerable amount of locomotive haulage of freight traffic in the mid-1990s. Freight traffic has included the disposal of nuclear waste. Today, all services, including Waterloo to Salisbury only trains, comprise the 159 units. These were supplied to the line in preference to electrification, and their versatility has meant they have widened their scope quite considerably. One direct result of privatisation being the introduction of a through Waterloo to Salisbury via Southampton service in the summer of 1996. By contrast, we now visit one of the Southern's most loved branch lines, the Hailing Island Line. On the 18th of August 1963, Stroudley Terrier No. 32662 runs into Haven Station. The Brighton Terriers were the only locomotives allowed over Langstone Bridge, joining the island to the mainland. The branch didn't quite last a century. The section from Haven to Langstone was opened in 1865, and to Hailing Island on the 17th of July, 1867. It closed completely on the 2nd of November, 1963. During that last summer, Terrier number 32660 departs from Hailing Island, whilst sister engine number 32650 prepares the next train.
number 32662 finally brings in another train from Havant. All three terriers are preserved. Today, Havant station still boasts a busy train service, but not to Hailing Island. The familiar southern region electric units of classes 4 SIG and 4 VEP dominate most workings. But the passengers now arrive at the station in their cars, which are parked where the little terriers once brought them to the junction. The remains of Langstone Bridge's signal box and pier support still stride across Langstone Harbour. It was the need to replace this bridge in 1963 at a cost of £400,000 that led to the line's demise. Unlike almost every other branch at the time, it was actually running at a profit. A solitary signal post remains to indicate that this was once a railway. Most of the line was converted to form the Haley Billing Path and Cycle Track, and these are the sorry remains of the terminus at Hailing Island today. Where the terriers once fussed about, known here as Hailing Billies and thus the name of the trail, today stands the almost inevitable industrial estate. A notice at the heart of what was once the station gives visitors the history, and the house in the background of this illustration can still be identified in Station Road to give a sense of perspective. One nice touch is that the industrial estate is hidden by a new building for the local theatrical society. It even looks a bit railway-like. We move on to Brockenhurst Station, 92 miles from Waterloo and opened on the 1st of June 1847. Bullet Pacific No. 34085 501 Squadron starts out on the 1 in 176 grade climb to Lymington Junction. On the 16th of July 1963, M7 No. 30107 departs from Brockenhurst on its way to Poole via the circuitous route known as Castleman's Corkscrew. Charles Castleman was a wealthy Wimborne solicitor who headed the railway company to build the line, designed to connect Southampton to Dorchester. It was opened on the 1st of June 1847 and passed through the stations of Holmesley, Ringwood, Ashley Heath, Westmoors, Wimborne and Broadstone. The arrival of the Dorset Central opened up a new route to Poole and the rapidly growing resort of Bournemouth, which hadn't even existed when the line was originally built. A direct route to Bournemouth from Brockenhurst opened in 1888, and the corkscrew effectively became redundant. The last passenger train ran on the 4th of May 1965. The M7 class tanks were introduced in 1897, for the London and South Western Railway to the design of the irascible Dugald Drummond, locomotive superintendent from 1895 to 90112. Number 30107, having deposited our cameraman, hauls Mansell push-pull set number 615 through pool to take water. This is Bournemouth Central, originally Bournemouth East. East and West were joined in 1884. In 1963, Drummond M7s were still being kept busy on station pilot duties. The down platform at Central was the second longest in the country, and Merchant Navy Class 35028 Clan Line departs from it for Bournemouth West. Clan Line is preserved in main line working order. Our views of the corkscrew are very different today. This is Brockenhurst with the first of the Wessex electric units used on services today to bear the livery of the new private operators of the whole of the Western Division of the Southern Railway stagecoach. It's ironic that the railways have been taken over by one of their old enemies. Stagecoach is a bus company. Holmesley, once Christchurch Road, has a new role as a tea rooms. The line itself became a road in the 1960s, soon after closure, allowing part of the new forest to revert to nature when it replaced the road past the naked man. 
the corkscrew itself has disappeared along with much of its route, notably at Ringwood, where the railway site has, like so many others, disappeared beneath industrial development. Only the pub gives a clue as to what was here, although one or two artefacts remain. At West Moors, it took our cameraman some time to work out where the railway had been at all, but one or two clues were seen. The best clue was the name of the trail. Wimborne was seen briefly from the train in 1963 with its tall signal box. Just one small railway item still exists here. The rest's become an industrial estate. Broadstone, once the junction for the Somerset and Dorset with the corkscrew, has disappeared entirely. The course of the new line down to Creekmore and Poole has, however, seen a new use as a relief road. Bournemouth Central is now simply Bournemouth Station, a major stop on a major route. The 1888 route was electrified in the 1960s as the corkscrew, which has also been known as the snake, was closed. For a considerable time, the third rail didn't extend beyond here, and trains for Weymouth were diesel built, giving rise to a unique push-pull system using diesel locomotives with unpowered electric top stock, known as 40 C sets. Our final modern then scenes show this practice in action as a train for Waterloo is made up. The unpowered sets were pushed up from Weymouth by the specially fitted Class 33 diesels and attached to the back of a powered electric set classified for rep. These were the most powerful electric units in the country with 3,300 horsepower in a four-car unit. They could haul two of the unpowered sets which could be used as driving trailers when being propelled. The rep stroke TC method of working came to an end in 1988 when the electrification was extended to Weymouth and the Wessex Electric self-contained power sets were introduced. They remain the main express units on the line today. Stopping services are supplied by the usual SIGs and VEPs. This one is leaving Bournemouth from the Long Down platform, now the longest in use in the country. Our final area is Southampton and District, starting at Winchester, where on the 16th of July 1963, one of Adam's delightful B4 dock tanks, number 30096, shunts Winchester City's goods yard. These little engines had strong links with Southampton. 30096 was built at the London and South Western Railways works at Nine Elms in November 1893. The LSWR had gained control of Southampton docks in 1891, and 14 of the class out of the total of 25 were sent there. Number 30096 received the name Normandy. She was withdrawn 70 years later and sold to Corals of Dybal's Wharf, Southampton, for further use. Her designer, William Adams, was locomotive superintendent of the LSWR from 1878 to 1895. Winchester City was reached by the LSWR on the 11th of May 1840 as part of the London to Southampton main line. The name Winchester City applied to the station between the 26th of September 1949 and the 10th of July 1967 to avoid confusion with the former GWR Chesil station, now closed. Two years later, number 30096, now named Coral Queen, shunts at Divers Wharf, Southampton on the 25th of March 1965, having been bought out of service on her withdrawal in 1963. Being an 040 tank, she was ideally suited to the sharp curves. Her driver, Bill Cummings, looked after his charge very well. She was to be the last working steam engine in the Southampton area. Not bad value for an engine which cost £1,150 to build. She got her reward and is lovingly cared for today on the Bluebell Railway. The important railway town of Eastleigh is 74 miles from Waterloo and was originally named Bishopstone. West Country Class 34029 Lundy roars by with an up express. She's followed by Standard Class 4460, number 75079, crawling by with a down train. One of Bullitt's Merchant Navy Class Pacifics, number 35023, Holland Africa Line, opens up after a signal check. Next, 
next is the last engine built at Brighton Works. Standard class four tank number 80154 running by light engine whilst an original LSWR locomotive, a URI class S15 number 30507 runs back to the shed. By contrast, an interloper in the form of a grimy Great Western Hall 460, number 6929 Walton Hall, heads away from Eastleigh with a York to Bournemouth train. Eastleigh Works, which opened in 1909 and replaced Nine Elms Works, can be seen in the gloomy background. Southampton was truly the heart of the LSWR. Maunsell U Class, number 31806, shunts a parcels van at Southampton Central for our first view here. On the 29th of April 1965, Bullied Merchant Navy Class number 35011 General Steam Navigation arrives and departs from Southampton Central with the famous Bournemouth Bell, all Pullman train. An immaculate West Country Class number 34097 Hallsworthy follows with a stopping train to Bournemouth. She was to meet her end at Cashmore Scrapyard far from home in Newport, South Wales in September 1966. Southampton Central was originally called Bletchingdon and was opened to traffic on the 1st of June 1847 as the first station on Castleman's Corkscrew. Here, Standard Class 4 Mogul number 76062 hauls a freight train out to the west under the splendid signal gantry now preserved as part of the National Collection. Following the Mogul is IVAT Class 2 262 tank, number 41324, running light engine. These useful engines were well liked by southern enginemen as they were easy to handle and good steamers. How the mighty have fallen. A filthy and decrepit Great Western 460, shorn of nameplates, pulls away with the York to Bournemouth through train. In the background, the clock tower of Southampton Civic Centre dominates the skyline above Central Station. The date was the 3rd of June 1965, and the halls would soon be withdrawn and their duties taken over by more foreigners, LMS Black Fives. Until the 1930s, the sea came up to the railway line. The southern reclaimed the land from the sea to build the western docks, whose cranes can be seen to the left of the picture. Here, one of Mansell's U-class moguls, number 31808, rebuilt from a river class 264 tank, hauls a freight toward Southampton from Millbrook. A clean, bullied West Country class, number 34095 Brentor, is our next stop, heading a passenger train for the stop at Southampton Central. This was a wonderful location for railway enthusiasts in steam days. Another Mansell mogul, number 31806, now preserved on the mid hans Railway, passes Millbrook Station. This station, 81 miles from Waterloo, was opened in November 1861, also on the corkscrew. A merchant Navy Pacific accelerates through Millbrook on the level track. The line seen to the right leads into the western or new docks built by the Southern Railway. A Mansell S15, number 30833, heads a parcels train out of these docks. A sign of changing times. A Hampshire diesel electric multiple unit clatters by as bullied Merchant Navy 35012 United States Lines is at the head of the Royal Wessex. Bullied number 34085 501 Squadron heads yet another up express. The evening shadows fall as an unrebuilt bullied number 34064 Fighter Command, uniquely fitted with a diesel ejector, heads into the setting sun. The shadows have fallen even further, and West Country Class 34041 Wilton has switched on her electric headlamps as she passes Millbrook. On the 13th of June 1963, the Southern is seen at its best as Merchant Navy Pacific 35021 New Zealand Line passes Millbrook with the Bournemouth Bell. Mansell U-Class Mogul number 31800 follows with a fitted freight. Merchant Navy Class 35015 Rotterdam Lloyd 
slows as it passes Millbrook's 1935 built signal box. The spectacular show continues with West Country Class number 34095 Brentor heading an up express towards Southampton Central. She was unusually built at Eastley Works in October 1949. Following her is Merchant Navy Class 35019 French Line CGT, one of Bullard's 30 merchant navies. She was built at Eastley Works in June 1945 and rebuilt there in May 1959. Next in the procession is Standard Class 5, number 73043, hauling Midland region stock. Mansell S15 goods engine number 30833 is seen again crawling by with a short freight. She's fitted with a six-wheel tender for use on the central division. These engines were developed from a URI design of 1920 for the LSWR and were useful mixed traffic locomotives, although officially built for goods duties. A train of petroleum tank wagons bound for the Esso refinery at Forley is overtaken by Merchant Navy No. 35008 Orient Line. Oil traffic was particularly important in the Southampton area. A double-chimneyed standard Class 4, No. 75079, plods its way from Millbrook before Brentor is seen once again. A procession of Great Western Halls then passes on different days in May 1965 with the York Bournemouth through train, bringing our sojourn at Millbrook and our views of the railways around Southampton as they were then to an end. Today, or now, the railways of the Southampton area continue to prosper. The goods yard at Winchester has become a car park, but the railway services here are the most comprehensive ever. The basic traffic is for commuters, but as this train shows, there are plenty of through trains to other parts of the country, this being a cross-country train service for Birmingham and Manchester. Freight activity is also intense, with freight liners operating to two terminals at Millbrook. Stopping passenger services are provided by the VEPS, introduced at the time of electrification here, 1967. Eastley has always been an important railway centre. In the 1990s, the service from Southampton to London was increased to three fast trains an hour, sometimes using the West of England Class 159 units. The town retains its link with its steam tradition and actually owns a working steam engine. Mansell designed S15 goods engine number 828, was built here and was restored at the works where it remains based. Eastley is also the freight centre for the area. Here a car carrying train with rovers for export through Southampton docks has just changed crews at the Down Island platform. The docks themselves see little rail traffic in the traditional sense, but tradition was well and truly acknowledged in 1995. To celebrate the 50th anniversary of D-Day, the self-same B4 dock tank Normandy, which we saw at Winchester as 30096, returned to her old haunts with demonstration goods trains. Southampton Central is now just Southampton, and the marvellous gantry has gone. However, trains still set off along the first part of the corkscrew, though few would recognise it as such today. The 
Wessex Electrics were the first air-conditioned electric multiple units in the country and are used either singly or in pairs on fast and semi-fast services on these lines. Finally, we return to Millbrook. An express speeds through formed of another Wessex unit. 24 of these were built in the late 1980s. In the opposite direction, a two-coach sprinter unit passes. These are owned by South Wales and West Railway and operate an hourly service on the cross-country route from Portsmouth to Cardiff. Local services at Millbrook are one of the exceptions to the general rule of service improvements, as they are now two hourly compared to hourly from the commencement of electrification. VEPs are the usual stock, although SIGs sometimes appear. In the background is the Millbrook Freightliner Depot. This was the first such in the Southampton area and is one of the oldest on the network. A second depot was built in the 1980s on the opposite side of the line and about a mile further west, known as Southampton Maritime. The traffic handled by these two depots has effectively taken over from all the traffic in the old-style docks, needing far less railway infrastructure. Oil traffic is still substantial in the area, but is reduced from its peak in the 1970s. This traffic is handled by the National ESW Railway. Our last view mixes traditional and modern practice as the preserved electric locomotive E5001 heads eastwards at Millbrook with a special from Bournemouth. Such trains operated by charterers were effectively the first private trains on British Rail, long before privatisation was started. If you've enjoyed this programme, look out for the other four in this series, as well as other programmes from Ian Allen SPS video covering the history of Britain's railways and the celebrated Railway Roundabout programmes.